introduction, and I want to thank all of the panelists here today. Um, I think this has been an incredibly rich conversation, and I appreciate um, all that you all have brought to you to, brought to this. Um, so I'm Quentin Palfrey. I'm the executive director uh, of JPAL North America, um, and it's my pleasure to spend a few minutes talking about where we go from here. Um, and I'm going to talk about this sort of in two veins. Um, the first is um, sort of where do we go from here more broadly in terms of the project of uh, creating a movement for evidence-based policymaking um, and j Powell North America's vision for moving that forward. Um, and also in the narrower sense of where we go from here with the state and local innovation competition um, and uh, the next, um, you know, the next day of our, our programming. Um, so as we mentioned before, um, j has been around for about 14 years, um, but j North America is relatively new. Um, we were founded um, uh, three years ago. Um, and, you know, our, our organization came about at a time of momentum um, for evidence-based policymaking. So um, we've talked a little bit um, about the, um, the work that's happened in Congress. There was the creation of this um, Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. Um, the White House has been interested in incorporating evidence um, into uh, federal programming, um, and that led to the creation of the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team. Um, and David Nyokum, who's here today, was involved with that, and j has been honored to be a part of uh, helping that work. And more broadly, you know, there has been this movement for incorporating impact evaluation into innovative financing design. So um, while we have a long way to go, this is a, a topic that's beginning to capture um, the imagination of people in, um, in, in governing. Um, and, you know, my sense, so I'm not an economist. Um, most of my career has been in government. I'm a lawyer. Um, and, um, you know, my sense is that uh, a lot of people in government um, really do want to be data-driven um, and want to be evidence-based in the policy that we roll out. But, you know, at our best, um, you know, a lot of the time, uh, people in government don't have the resources um, and they don't have the know-how um, to do this on their own. Um, and so um, one of the things that, in terms of our sort of theory of change, um, is that you know, building this bridge between the research community and the policymaking community um, can have a real impact. Um, and not just in terms of uh, sort of looking at programs as they roll out, but sometimes in terms of scaling up programs. Um, so um, as Marianne mentioned, um, j has run hundreds of evaluations over the last um, 14 years. And by j I mean uh, scholars affiliated with uh, j network. Um, and the vast majority of uh, the impact, hundreds of millions of people impacted by these programs, um, have been impacted by the scale up of programs um, where governments have been engaged um, in that, um, in that policy making. Um, and so that's really the impetus behind um, sort of two programs that we're doing. Um, the one that we're talking about here today is the State and Local Innovation uh, Initiative. We've also um, adapted a fairly similar model um, as one element of our healthcare delivery um, competition. Um, and what this has allowed us to do is really um, dig into partnerships uh, with governments at a local level um, and really sort of think about how we can work together, how we can match our scholarly community um, to innovative policymakers who are trying to incorporate evidence into the design of programs. Um, and with the first cohort of governments that we selected um, last year, some of whom are represented here today, um, so we have uh, Puerto Rico and Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, South Carolina and the city of Rochester, um, are working on a whole bunch of interesting innovation, innovative programs to increase employment, to help people move out of poverty, to expand opportunity for young people, to find effective treatments for substance abuse, use, substance use disorders. Um, and if you combine our two, um, the, these two programs um, in, the, in 2016, we started um, nine new partnerships across the country. Um, and, you know, we sort of think about what is it that um, we bring to the, the, that the researchers bring to the table, what is it to, that um, uh, policymakers bring to the table, 
Um, and on the implementing partner side, right, as on the government side, you know, they want to have, they, they often have a problem that they're struggling with. Um, and they, they have a hypothesis um, or they have a program um, that, that's uh, focused on solving that problem. Um, and, you know, for this kind of a partnership to work, there are lots of uh, ways to incorporate evidence into policymaking. But for us to do the kind of randomized uh, control trials that we do well, um, we need to be working at a sufficient scale to detect meaningful changes in outcomes. Um, and, you know, we're looking for partners who are willing to think creatively about how to incorporate evidence into their, um, to, to, to their governance. Um, we also mentioned, and I'll talk about this in a second, you know, uh, data is just this extremely important component of what we're looking for um, in terms of opportunities to incorporate um, uh, evidence based uh, evidence into policy making and on the research partners side um, you know the researchers have a research agenda they have a certain set of things that they're interested in and they care about and so you have to sort of match it with uh, with what they're uh, they're interested in um, and you know the the researchers really roll up their sleeves as Sarah was talking about earlier you really have to work with the partner to assess the feasibility of the evaluation. You have to think creatively about the design the evaluation. Um, and you know, you, uh, sometimes our researchers really have some expertise in terms of navigating um, the institutional issues and the data issues. Um, and uh, one of the things that we focused on as a, maybe a rate limiting factor or, or, or an institutional change that we can help um, is that these data issues are really important. So um, we've uh, created a guide for um, helping uh, researchers and others uh, navigate um, uh, the complexities of working with administrative data because administrative data, when it can be incorporated into uh, a randomized controlled trial, allows us to work at lower costs, uh, allows us not to have to collect as much survey data, which really br brings down uh, the cost and the burden, um, and it allows us to look at a much richer set of outcomes. So this data piece is an enormously important part. I mentioned to you also the Comm Commission on Evidence based policy making, we're, we are focused on trying not, to, not just to help people um, navigate a system that doesn't work optimally, but also to think about ways that we can work together um, to make some changes to the system to make that easier. Um, but beyond these individual collaborations, right, we're also trying to build a movement for evidence-based policy making. So I know that we all want to identify important and policy relevant questions um, and use rigorous evaluation tools to figure out what works, um, move sort of iteratively towards better and better answers um, to how to solve social policy questions. But it's a little bit more than that too, right? We also want to change the way that governance is done, right? We want to make it second nature for people who enter government to think about ways of incorporating evidence into their policy making so that they can be better producers and consumers of evidence so that they can identify opportunities to learn more about their programs as they roll them out. Um, and so some of this is the virtuous cycle that I think we were talking about earlier, um, where it's not just a question of let's find something, let's test it, let's move on. It's a lot more iterative than that. Even with respect to a particular program, a lot of what we're trying to do is um, sort of come up with our best hypothesis, uh, test it, modify it, come up with a better hypothesis, test it, modify it, look at it in other uh, contexts. And this really is science. This really is the scientific method. And the scientific method isn't a silver bullet. It's a series of iterative approaches that allow us to get more and more sophisticated over time about what's working. So that's one piece of it. But the other piece of it, right, is building up an institutional way of doing business within jurisdiction. So one of the things that's so exciting about what Christian Sora was talking about, about South Carolina as an example, is it's not just one evaluation, it's also building up a data system, it's building up a cadre of people within that government who know how to be good producers and consumers of evidence, who are willing to test a whole bunch of different things, who are willing to think about, okay, here's the one that, that, that um, that Kate will still be working on in the mid-2020s, and here's the one that we're going to actually answer in 2017 or, or, or be working on in a, in a really fast timeline. And creating a, 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 
a network within a particular jurisdiction where that's what the legislature demands, where a new person comes into a government office and they say, here's how we do things here. Let me tell you, when there's a resource constraint, we think about that as an opportunity to randomize. When we're piloting a new program, here's what we do, where the legislature says, we'll fund that, but we're also going to fund a little piece of, uh, of this for evaluation. We want you to come back and tell us what you learned. So we want to create these ecosystems within policymaker communities where this is actually how it's done. So let me talk for a second about what policymakers can do. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what JPL can do and then I'll, then I'll wrap up with, with, with state and local. So on the policymaker side, um, you know, Part of it is learning what's out there, right? What do we know so far about what works? What, what are the studies? Where is there some rigorous evidence? And some of that is learning to distinguish between good and bad evidence, right? Is learning to be an educated consumer of evidence. And some of it is about being a producer of evidence. So constraints are this thing when we're, we're, when we're talking about poverty, because we're the poverty action lab. Most of the services that governments provide and that philanthropy provides to poor people is resource constrained. That's a terrible thing. It breaks our heart when we think about programs and we can't supply them to all of the people we want to supply them to. But it's also an opportunity to incorporate randomization to the design of the program, to not do first come, first serve, to do something else that allows us to learn and make the case that something works, or figure out that it doesn't and spend that money, that precious money, on things that, uh, that might work. Um, so using constraints, using waiting lists um, as a smart thing, when you have a new idea, being smart about how you pilot it, piloting it, rolling it out in a way that allows us to learn from it, allows us to iterate on the concept, allows us to develop an evidence base. Um, and also, you know, um, in the sort of nuts and bolts sense, seeking ways to link administrative data. Everybody should be like South Carolina. We should think about ways of making data available to researchers and the public and make it easy, right? So a lot of things are, are, are theoretically available to the research community, but it's so hard to get it and to get it linked in the right ways that you're discouraging people from doing the kinds of evaluation that are going to help you deliver services better. Um, and then finally, to sharing best practices. We do want other jurisdictions to be like Christian Sora. We want to take the South Carolina Medicaid example and we want to replicate it across a whole bunch of other uh, uh, Medicaid offices. We want to take other examples and we want to scale them. Um, on the JPAL side um, and on the scholarly side, what can we do? So one thing we can do is we can disseminate existing policy lessons so that others can uh, better align resources with evidence. We can do what we're doing here today and what we're doing with the state and local innovation competition, which is foster collaboration, catalyze the kinds of partnerships that are going to allow the research community and the, um, the policymaking community to work together to make better decisions to learn from uh, innovative programming. Um, one of the things we're doing um, and we're very, very excited about is creating new resources for people um, to understand the best practices. So resources for researchers, resources for government officials. Um, there is a playbook. We are developing best practices. We are learning how to do this better and better. Um, and we want to make it easier for people to learn what we know. Um, enhancing strategic partnerships across um, different sectors. Um, to, uh, to institutionalize good evidence-based practices. Eventually, what we want is a movement. We want to replicate what works, not just in terms of individual policy approaches, but also in, in this way of doing business, in this way of generating and using evidence. And then finally, expanding access to and the use of administrative data. Um, so what's next? Um, we have an innovation competition. Um, uh, jurisdictions can apply. State and local governments can apply to JPAL. Um, what we will provide is technical support, um, and this is actually probably the most important thing at the front end, um, to work with a jurisdiction to figure out what is, um, you know, what's feasible. Um, we, we provide a little bit of flexible pilot funding. Um, this is largely to make it possible for jurisdictions to focus on this question, to free up resources, um, sometimes to work out some data issues. Um, and uh, also importantly, matchmaking with j -PAL's network of researchers. Um, so ideally what we do is we spend some time working with jurisdictions, um, building up a research project and getting it to the point uh, where we can pair 
the jurisdiction with the researcher, um, and then uh, ideally go forward with a larger evaluation um, that the, the researcher from the JPAL network can also apply for resources um, to fund. So what do, we, what do we need jurisdictions to do? Um, it's a fairly simple application by design. So we want people to apply with a letter of interest, I mean, three to five pages. Um, it, it, uh, it should identify a policy question or a challenge that motivates the application. Um, it should talk about the hypothesis on the government intervention that will address that challenge. Um, it, it should talk about how new evidence will help uh, deliver that program or service better. Um, and it should um, identify opportunities for randomization um, and uh, you know, state of willingness to use randomization as a tool for generating more evidence. Um, so the application timeline, um, today, uh, today is our, our convening. On February 17th, we're gonna accept uh, letters of interest. Um, and then uh, we will identify finalists. Um, the finalists will be invited to submit full proposals on March 20th. Uh, we'll then um, ask for full proposals. Those will be due April 17th, um, and then we'll announce the winners um, in May of 2017. Um, so, uh, so I hope that um, some of you uh, who are not working with us now will consider applying through this process. I hope some uh, folks who are uh, joining us through through the live stream or or watching this video afterwards will um, will consider applying for um, uh, to work with us. Um, and we hope that we can foster a whole new set of partnerships to help move, mil, build this movement for evidence-based policy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Quentin. Um, I'm going to do a few quick thank yous, and then we'll all have some food. Um, so I, I want to start by thanking especially the staff who put in many, many hours to prepare not only this convening, but in working with all of you and, and bringing you here. Um, in particular, Rose and Julia, and also Elizabeth and Sophie. You probably recognize these names from the many emails that you got. Um, I also want to especially acknowledge the staff who've been working with our first cohort um, of state and local partners over the last couple of months, um, Steve, Ben, Rohit, Vincent, Laura, Emma, Todd, and Kyle. Um, and it's, it's great to have both you, our partners, and them here in the room today and tomorrow. Um, the other thing I want to mention, I just particularly want to thank our partners who are here today, like Pew and Results for America, um, and like the, the Government Performance Lab and our philanthropic partners, of course, including the Arnold Foundation, um, because we're not doing this in a vacuum, and I think it's incredibly valuable for us to be able to partner with complementary efforts that are underway um, across the country. So I know I've been incredibly inspired by what we've heard today. I've been especially inspired by hearing from the government side, uh, people who've really been committed to this kind of work. Um, and I think my main takeaway is that this is both incredibly important work, and it can also be very hard. Um, and there are a lot of challenges that can come up operationally when we're, we're trying to do this kind of work. And so that's why we uh, have both today, which was to you know, kind of spark our initial conversation, and then also tomorrow when we'll be learning from each other. Um, and the jurisdictions will be sharing their experiences across a variety of, of areas as they've been thinking about designing and launching these kinds of projects. So I'm very excited to continue um, the conversation with you tomorrow. Um, a couple of logistics, so tomorrow we'll have breakfast out here starting at 8.30, and then we'll start in the same room again at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So that's the schedule for tomorrow, for those of you who are joining us for that. Um, and now we'll also have a reception just down the hall, and we'll have a, a bunch of staff who can guide you in the right direction for that. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.